So we left off on the 27th section, the 27th juz, and we are in the middle of Surat al If uh, this is your first time, uh, the best way to approach the Quran is to make wudu, which is a physical ablution, set your intention straight, and then uh, uh, ask for an opening from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within those intentions so that he can open up your heart, open up your mind, and help you with your reasoning faculties to come to the conclusion of truth. Once that is done, what you want to do is you want to seek refuge from the accursed shaitan by saying, "Aud billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim." Just to preface once again, I am not a scholar, so these are not opinions on the Quran whatsoever. Rather, it's my own personal reflections. But side by side with me, I do have uh, Tafsir Sadi. Uh, alhamdulillah, uh, Sadi is indeed a scholar. Uh, a mufassir, and um, he gives us some deeper insights into the Quran. All right, so without further ado, let's just go ahead and uh, jump right on in to the reading. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, continuing on where we left off. Abraham said, then what is your business here, O messengers? So we left off where uh, Ibrahim salam was greeted with uh, messengers, uh, angels that were appearing in the form of human beings. And when he served them this beautiful platter of food, uh, they didn't eat, so he hesitated. And uh, there is uh, this story all throughout the Quran. So uh, this is going to give us some additional insight into that story. Uh, perhaps some um, additional info that was uh, not available for us in the previous chapters. All right. They said, indeed, we have been sent to a people of criminals to send down upon them stones of clay, marked in the presence of your Lord for the transgressors. So we brought out whoever was in them, i.e. the cities of the believers. And we found not within them other than a single house of Muslims. So imagine going towards a city. And in that entirety of that city, there's only one house of people that have submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we left therein a sign for those who fear the painful punishment. And in Moses was a sign when we sent him to Pharaoh with clear authority. But he turned away with his supporters and said, a magician or a madman, meaning he labeled uh, Musa a magician or a madman. So we took him and his soldiers and cast them into the sea, and he was blameworthy. And an ad was a sign. When we sent against them the barren wind, it left nothing of what it came upon, but that it made it like disintegrated ruins. And in Thamud, when it was said to them, enjoy yourselves for a time. But they were insolent towards the command of their Lord. So the thunderbolt seized them while they were looking on. And they were unable to arise, nor could they defend themselves. And we destroyed the people of Noah before indeed, they were a people defiantly disobedient. And the heaven we constructed with strength, and indeed we are its expander. And the earth we have spread out, and excellent is the preparer. And of all things we created two mates, i.e. counterparts. Perhaps you will remember. So flee to Allah, indeed I am to you from him a clear warner. And do not make as equal with Allah another deity, indeed I am to you from him a clear warner. So two emphasis on warning once again, back to back. And something else that's neat here, uh, you have a claim from the Quran that the universe is limited and it's finite. And the way you draw that conclusion is uh, obviously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the heavens, right? The semawat. And it says here, we constructed with uh, strength and indeed we are its expander. Meaning the Quran is claiming that the known space is expanding. And if something were to be infinite, uh, there would be no room for expansion. So we have a, a, a limited, finite um, space that is uh, under constant expansion. And I encourage you to take a look at the uh, theories on redshift and the conclusions that were drawn from redshift. Because this further validates the claim of the Quran that indeed uh, space is expanding. 
Similarly, there came not to those before them any messenger except that they said a magician or a madman. Th did they suggest it to them? Rather, they themselves are a transgressing people. So leave them, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for you are not to be blamed. And remind, for indeed the reminder benefits the believers. And I did not create the jinn and mankind except to worship me. So remember, uh, in Islam, we have an answer to the three fundamental questions of life. Where did I come from? What's my purpose? And where am I going? And here is uh, that uh, middle question being answered to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I do not want from them any provision, nor do I want them to feed me. Indeed, it is Allah who is the continual provider, the firm possessor of strength. And indeed, for those who have wronged is a portion of punishment like the portion of their companions, i.e. predecessors. So let them not impatiently urge me. And woe to those who have disbelieved from their day, which they are promised. So not only in regards to the day of judgment, but also in regards to the minor day, which is their death, right? Beautiful. That concludes the Surah al Dariyat. Uh, now we have Surah Al-Tur. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. By the mount and by a book inscribed, in parchment spread open, and by the frequented house, and by the ceiling, i.e. heavens raised high, and by the sea set on fire, indeed the punishment of your Lord will occur. Of it there is no preventer. On the day the heavens will sway with circular motion, and the mountains will pass on, departing. Then woe that day to the deniers uh, who are in empty discourse amusing themselves. The day they are thrust towards the fire of hell with a violent thrust, its angels will say, this is the fire which you used to deny. Now, uh, upon personal reflection, and I have to uh, do a little bit more in-depth research on this, but in regards to the mountains um, passing on, uh, there is a, a uh, an idea that I have in my head that mass will be removed from uh, objects and they'll be like floating tufts of wool, right? Uh, these gigantic mountains. Uh, for curiosity's sake, I'm going to head over to the Tafsir to see if there is um, some additional information that we can gather uh, from the Mufassirun. Um, so let's take a quick look while I scroll down there. And this is just in the beginning verses, so I don't think it'll take me long. Rather, it is um, just making sure that it's clumped together significantly. So we have verses 1 all the way to 16 being clumped together. So some of them we haven't gotten to yet. So here's what Sadi has to say. Here Allah swears by these great things that are based on immense wisdom to the truth of the resurrection and the requital of the pious and the disbelievers. He swears by Mount Sinai, which is the mountain on which Allah spoke to his prophet Musa ibn uh, Imran salam, and revealed what he revealed to him of rulings. This is pointing out the great blessing that Allah bestowed upon him and his nation, as the blessings of Allah cannot be appreciated fully or evaluated properly, for they are beyond measure. And by a book inscribed, it may be that what is meant is Allah al mahfud So again, this is the, um, the eternal tablet. I encourage you to take a look into that as well. In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written all things. Or it may be uh, what is meant is the Holy Quran, which is the best book that Allah sent down, containing stories and knowledge of the earlier and later generations. Uh, on an unfurled parchment. That is open, unconcealed pages, the nature of which the nature of which is not hidden from anyone who is rational and has insight. And by the much frequented house, this refers to the house that is above the seventh heaven that is frequented at all times by the noble angels. Every day, 70,000 angels enter it, worshiping their Lord therein. Then they will never return to it until the day of resurrection. And, that, and it was suggested that the much frequented house is the sacred house of Allah, which is the Kaaba, which is frequented by those who circumambulate it, pray and remember Allah at all times. 
and by delegations who come to it for Hajj and Umrah, as Allah swore by it elsewhere. <clears throat> there is a reference here, and by the secure city in Mecca, which is in Surah Din, 95, chapter 95, verse 3, we haven't gotten there yet. Um, such a house that is the best house on earth, that is the destination for anyone who goes for Umrah or Hajj, which is one of the pillars of Islam, without which Islam cannot be complete. And that was built by Ibrahim and Ismail, and Allah made it a focal point for the people and sanctuary. It deserves that Allah uh, should swear by it and highlight of its greatness and sanctity that is appropriate to it. And by the canopy of heavens raised high, that is the sky by which Allah has made a canopy for all creatures and the roof for the earth, from which light is received by the markers and lights of which people navigate, and from which Allah sends down rain, mercy, and all kinds of provision. And by the sea kept filled, that is filled with water, which Allah has contained and prevented from overflowing and swamping the land even though by nature it should cover the entire face of the earth. But his wisdom dictated that he should prevent it from flowing freely and flooding the land, so that all kinds of creatures can live on the face of the earth. It was also suggested what is meant by masjur, translated here as kept filled, is set on fire, which will happen on the day of resurrection. So it will become a raging fire that is filled and in all its greatness and vastness with all kinds of torment. The fact that Allah swears by these things indicates that they are among the signs of Allah and offer evidence and proof of his oneness and might, and that he will resurrect the dead. Hence, he says, verily, the punishment of your Lord will surely come to pass. That is, it will inevitably happen, for Allah does not break his promise or his word. There is none who can avert it or ward it off, and there is no, impend uh, no impediment that can prevent it, because no one can resist or escape the might of Allah. Then Allah describes that day on which the punishment will come to pass. On that day when the heavens will convulse in a great convulsion, that is, the heavens will rotate in turmoil, continuously moving in a chaotic fashion and not remaining still. Um, uh, and it says, and the mountains move and pass away. That is, they will shift from their places and move like clouds, changing color. Then they will crumble and become like scattered dust. All of that will be due to the immense fear and terrible events of the day of resurrection and the turmoil and upheaval that will cause this disturbance to these great entities. So how about feeble human beings? A uh, very valid question indeed. <clears throat> then woe that day to the deniers. The word translated here as woe is a word that encompasses all punishment, grief, torment, and fear. Then Allah describes the deniers who are deserving of woe those who amuse themselves with vain discourse, that is, discourse about falsehood with which they amuse themselves. Their knowledge and learning is aimed at the pursuit of harmful types of knowledge for the purpose of rejecting the truth and confirming falsehood. Their deeds are the deeds of people of ignorance, foolishness, and idle pursuits, in contrast to the way of the people of faith who pursue beneficial knowledge and righteous deeds. <clears throat> On the day when they are shoved forcibly towards the fire of hellfire, that is, on the day when they are pushed harshly and driven violently towards it, dragged on their faces, it will be said to them by way of rebuke and blame, this is the fire which you used to deny. So today, taste the eternal punishment, which no one could estimate or describe. So is this magic, or can you not see? It may be that this refers to the fire and punishment as indicated by the context. In other words, when they see the fire and the punishment, it will be said to them by way of rebuke. Is this magic that has no reality? For you can see it. Or did you not see when you were in the world? <clears throat> in other words, did you have no insight or knowledge? And were you ignorant of this matter for which no proof was established for you? The response in both cases is in the negative. As for the idea of it being magic, it will become clear to them that this is indeed the truest of truths, which is contrary to magic in all respects. As for the idea of them not seeing it, that is not the case. Rather, the proof of a law was established against them, and the messengers called them to believe in that, establishing evidence and proof to the effect that made it, the hereafter and the punishment, one of the issues that had the most proof and clearest of evidence.
Now remember, earlier on in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that uh, he will make it clear to, to people, uh, both within themselves and from the outside, that, they, that uh, Islam is indeed the truth and uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate reality. Or, may, or it may be that the question, so is this magic or can you not see, refers to what the messenger والسلام, brought of clear truth and the straight path. In other words, was the message brought by Muhammad وسلم, magic or is it that you could not see to the extent that you are confused? In fact, this message is the clearest and truest of all things and the proof of Allah has been established against them. And whether you not uh, burn therein, that is, enter the fire so that it may envelop you and contain your physical being uh, from all directions. And whether you bear it patiently or not, it will make no difference to you. That is, patience will be no benefit to you in the fire, and you will not be able to console one another. The punishment will not be alleviated for you, for it is not one of those things of which the intensity will diminish if it is born with patience. Uh, that will happen to them because of their evil deeds. Hence, Allah says, you will be requited only for what you used to do. So re remember, uh, it's uh, it's a, an idea of consequence. And these are people that are upon strict disbelief. And they've also caused a lot of um, discourse, uh, discord. And they've, they've caused a lot of trial to, to others, right? Okay, carrying on. Uh, so 15 and 16 were covered in that reading but I'm going to reread them uh, for benefit's sake. So bismillah. Then is this magic or do you not see? Enter to burn therein, then be patient or impatient. It is all the same for you. You are only being recompensed for what you used to do. So again, consequential, right? Exactly what they used to do. And then there's a uh, recompense. Okay, beautiful. Indeed, the righteous will be in gardens and pleasure. Enjoy what their Lord has given, uh, enjoying what their Lord has given them and their Lord protected them from the punishment of hellfire. They will be told, eat and drink in satisfaction for what you used to do. Now, I genuinely wonder what degree of satisfaction that would be, right? Because if you wanted to experience so many things, just where exactly is that level of satisfaction, right? Because you're not necessarily going to have like a feeling of being full and like develop this, you know, when you like overeat and you're super tired and like all lethargic and stuff like that, I don't think you're going to have that feeling in Jannah, right? Otherwise, that would be a, an imperfection in a perfect environment. So genuinely curious what that satisfaction will be. <clears throat> they will be reclining on thrones lined up and we will marry them to fair women with large, beautiful eyes. And those who believed and whose descendants followed them in faith, we will join with them their descendants and we will not deprive them of anything of their deeds every person for what he earned is retained and we will provide them with fruit and meat from whatever they desire they will exchange with one another a cup of wine wherein results no ill speech or commission of sin now <clears throat> obviously this is addressed here but it says that there's no commission of sin meaning that this is not an intoxicating form of wine it's not like the wine of uh, the earth or the dunya, rather it's a pure form of wine. There will circulate among them servant boys, especially for them, as if they were pearls well protected, and they will approach one another inquiring of each other. They will say, indeed, we were previously amongst our people fearful of displeasing Allah, so Allah conferred favor upon us and protected us from the punishment of the scorching fire. Indeed, we used to supplicate him before Indeed, it is he who is the beneficial or the beneficent, the merciful. So remind, O Muhammad, وسلم, for you are not by the favor of your Lord a soothsayer or a madman. Or do they say of you, a poet for, for whom we await a misfortune of time? Say, wait, for indeed I am with you among the waiters. <clears throat> because it is indeed a giant waiting game. And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing is basically calling people's bluffs, right? These guys are saying a bunch of stuff. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I've got all the time in the world. I'm the creator of time. So you just go ahead and wait. Or do, they, or do their minds command them to say this, or are they a transgressing people? Or do they say he has made it up? Rather, they do not believe. Then let them produce a statement like it, if they should be truthful. Or were they created by nothing? Or were they the creators of themselves? 
Or did they create the heavens and the earth? Rather, they are not certain. Or have they the uh, depositories containing the provision of your Lord? Or are they the controllers of them? Or have they stairways into heaven upon which they listen? Then let their listener produce a clear authority, i.e. a proof. Or has he daughters while you have sons? Or do you, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, ask of them a payment so they are by debt burdened down? Or have they knowledge of the unseen so they write it down? Or do they intend a plan, but those who disbelieve, they are the object of a plan? <clears throat> or have they a deity other than Allah, exalted as Allah above whatever they associate with him? Now, just take a quick moment to reflect on all of these verses. And... <laughs> SubhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally lays out like every single argument face value as to what's being used. Or this, or this, or this, or this, or this, or this. Now just take a look at modern times and what people's mentality is, and you'll see how the Quran reveals their psychology and reveals where they're at, right? So remember, just like Pharaoh, he wanted to build a stairway into the heavens, and he wanted to see the Lord of, of Moses, right? Uh, or the pagans that said, no, we're going to keep sons for ourselves and we're going to attribute daughters uh, to uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Or, do they, or is it you, O prophet, that's seeking? What's your motive? Is your motive payment? So the people that say, oh, you're, you're trying to go after power and payment, uh, money and all this other stuff, just as clear as day, right? And the arguments are already laid out, meaning nobody can invent anything new against this book, right? SubhanAllah. <clears throat> carrying on and if they were to see a fragment from the sky falling they would say it is merely clouds heaped up so leave them until they meet their day in which they will be struck insensible the day their plan will not avail them at all nor will they be helped and indeed for those who have wronged is a punishment before that but most of them do not know and be patient, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, for the decision of your Lord. For indeed, you are in our eyes, i.e., sight, and exalted uh, Allah, and exalt Allah with praise of your Lord when you arise, and in part of the night exalt Him, and after the setting of the stars. Now, <clears throat> again, for my own personal curiosity and for everybody's benefit, I'm definitely going to check out the tafsir to see what additional insights we can get between the verses of 32 and 43 with all of those um, or, or, or comments and uh, the things that were basically the argumentation that was put forward. So Asadi lumps uh, verses 29 all the way down to 43, uh, which contains exactly that. And let's see if uh, we can see if there's some additional um, lessons that can be encapsulated. Usually what he tends to do uh, when there's segments like this or a deep segment uh, is give us some additional pieces of information. So let's check it out. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs uh, his messenger alayhi salatu to remember, uh, to remind the people, both Muslims and disbelievers, so as to establish the proof of Allah against the wrongdoers and so that the fortune will be guided by, uh, the fortunate will be guided by this reminder. And he tells him that he should not pay any attention to the words and annoyance of the disbelieving polytheists and what they say to bar people from following him, even though they know that he is the furthest removed of all people from what they accuse him of. Hence, Allah declared him to be above any of his accusations that they made against him, as he said, for by the grace of your Lord, that is, by his kindness and favor, you are neither a soothsayer who has a jinni with them, who he communicates and who brings him some news of the unseen, adding to it a hundred lies. So soothsayers were communicating with the unseen. So again, we believe in uh, different types of creation. We have the creation of uh, insan, which is mankind, and we have jinn. Uh, so the shaitan is a creation, uh, Satan is a, created, a creation of the jinn kind. Right. And these soothsayers are communicating with jinn in order to uh, receive some type of additional information from the unseen world. Now, uh, it's to our understanding that there are good jinn and there are bad jinn. But these bad jinn tend to be the ones to respond to these soothsayers because soothsayers are typically evil people seeking to get a, a leg up on somebody. 
okay? So uh, this there is a footnote here in regards to the soothsayers who speak to these jinn. That is to listen to angels and thus know that they are following, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, no, that's not that footnote. Mm, yeah, uh, disregard that. So that's a little bit down. So he says, who has a jinni with him who is communicating and who brings him some news of the unseen, adding to it a hundred lies, nor a madman who has lost his mind. Rather, you are the most rational of people and the most mature in thinking and the furthest removed from the devils. You are the most truthful of people and the most perfect in dignity. And sometimes they say of him, that is, he is a poet who composes poetry and what he has brought is poetry. But Allah says, we have not taught him the prophet poetry, nor could he have had been a poet. And that's in Surah Yasin. We covered that in the earlier section. Uh, Surah Yasin is chapter 36, and this particular verse is verse 69. We are waiting for some misfortune to befall him. That is, we are waiting for him to die, for then his call will come to an end and we will be rid of him. Say to them in response to these foolish words, wait then, that is for me to die. And I am waiting with you, waiting for Allah to afflict you with the punishment, either directly from him or at his hands. <clears throat> it is their reasoning that prompts them to say this, or uh, is it their reasoning that prompts them to say this, or are they a people transgressing beyond bounds? That is, does this rejection of you and what they say stem from their reasoning and rational thinking? What bad reasoning it is that led to such a conclusion and outcome? For no doubt, reasoning that concluded that the most perfect of people in reason was insane and deemed the most truthful of truth as a lie and falsehood is indeed reasoning of a level to which even the insane would not sink. That's a very powerful statement. That means basically even a guy who is out of his mind completely would not think that a prophet of God is coming and bringing falsehood. Okay. Or is it that that what made them reach this conclusion was their wrongdoing and transgression? This is in fact what it is, for transgression knows no limit. So such words and deeds are not surprising on the part of the transgressor who goes beyond all bounds. And now here is the or, or, or. Or do they say he has made it the Qur'an of himself? That is, do they say that Muhammad has made up the Qur'an of his own accord? Rather, they are not willing to believe. For if they believe, they would not say such things. Then let them produce a discourse like it if they are telling the truth. When they say that he made it up, for you are eloquent and well-spoken Arabs, and you have been challenged to produce something like it. Thus you will either prove your point, or if you fail, you will confirm that it is the truth, and that even if you all came together, humans and jinns, so meaning those soothsayers and the ones that they're calling upon, you would not be able to produce the like of it. Therefore, you are left with two choices. Either you may believe in it and follow its guidance, or you can stubbornly persist in following what you know of falsehood. And we know that disbelief is a perpetual act of disbelief, right? So you have the ability to stop, but you have to be sincere. <clears throat> but these, these disbelievers choose to go down that um, just a, a, a stupid path. Were they created by nothing or were they themselves the creators? This is an argument against them by presenting an argument that leaves them with no choice but to submit to it or to go beyond the framework of reason and religious teachings, and thus demonstrate how lost they are. To explain further, they deny the oneness of Allah and reject his messenger, which leads to denying that Allah created them. But it is well established on the basis of reason as well as religious teachings with regard to the issue of creation that only one of three scenarios may apply. Either they were created by nothing, in other words, there is no creator who created them, rather they came into existence without anyone to bring them into existence, which is impossible, or they created themselves, which is also impossible because it cannot be imagined that they brought themselves into existence. Having ruled out these two scenarios, as it is clear that they are impossible, it becomes clear that the only answer is the third scenario, which is that it is Allah who created them. Once that is established, it is known that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who is deserving of worship, the only one to whom worship should be devoted, and it is not right or proper to worship any except him. And again, that pure monotheism uh, of Islam. Or did they create the heavens and the earth? 
this is a question which indicates that they did not do that. In other words, they did not create the heavens and the earth because in that case, they would be partners with the law. This is very clear. But the disbelievers lack certainty of faith. That is, they do not have proper knowledge or any certainty that would make them benefit from the textual and rational evidence. <clears throat> or do they possess the treasuries of your Lord or do they rule supreme? That is, do these disbelievers possess the treasuries of your Lord's mercy so that they may give it to whom, whomever they wish and withhold it from whomever they want? So that is why they wanted to prevent Allah from bestowing prophethood upon his slave and messenger, um, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as if they were in charge of the treasuries of Allah's mercy when they are too insignificant for that, for they have no power to benefit or harm themselves or to cause death, give life, or resurrect. Is it they who distribute the blessings of your Lord? It is we who distribute their li uh, li livelihood among them in the life of this world. And that's in Surah Zuhruf, uh, chapter 43, verse 32. We covered that in the previous segment. Or do they rule supreme? That is, do they have authority over the creation and dominion of Allah by means of force and strength? That is not so. Rather, they are helpless and weak. Do they have a means of ascending to heavens in order to listen to those on high? That is, do they have the ability to find out about the unseen and listen to those on high so that they are told about matters that no one else knows? Then let their listeners who make that claim produce clear uh, proofs. But where will he get that from? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the knower of the unseen and the seen. And he does not allow anyone to learn about the unseen except the messengers with whom he is pleased whom he tells whatever he wills. Because Muhammad وسلم, is the best and most knowledgeable of the messengers and their leader, and is the one who conveyed whatever he was told about the oneness of Allah, his promise and warning and other matters of truth, whereas the deniers are the people of ignorance, misguidance, transgression, and stubbornness, then of which of the two parties is more deserving of having their word accepted? Especially since the messenger وسلم, has established proof and evidence for what he said, which makes what he said something very certain and most truthful, whereas they have not established any argument for their claims, let alone clear proof. And it's true. All they would do is just make these um, stupid arguments, basically, but they would never establish any forms of proof. They would just say, what about this? What about this? What about this? Right? Does he have daughters, as you claim, whilst you have sons? Thus you combine two mistakes by ascribing offspring to him and choosing for him the lesser of the two categories. Is there any greater disrespect towards the Lord of the worlds than this? Or is it that you, O Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, are asking them for recompense, for conveying the message, which they find too burdensome? That is not so. Rather, you are keen to teach them for nothing in return, and in fact, you are spending a great deal of money on them so that they may accept your message and uh, respond to your call. And you give to those whose hearts are to be won over so as to establish knowledge and faith in their hearts. Or do they have knowledge of the unseen which they are writing down? So they write down what they know of the unseen and thus gain information and knowledge of which the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not aware. Then they oppose him and stubbornly resist him because of knowledge of the unseen that they have but it is known that they are an unlettered nation, ignorant and misguided. It is the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who has more knowledge than anyone else. For Allah has granted him knowledge of the unseen that he did not disclose to anyone else. All of this proves to them by means of both rational and textual evidence that their views are corrupt and proves in the clearest and most eloquent manner to which no objections can be raised that what they say is false? Or do they intend by criticizing you and the message you have brought a plot against you, O Muhammad, to invalidate your religion and cause you trouble? But it is those who disbelieve who will be outwitted. That is, their plot will backfire and it is they who will be harmed by it. And Allah indeed brought that about to help uh, to him be praised. The disbelievers did not spare any effort in their plot, but Allah supported his prophet and his religion against them and caused them to fail and be defeated. 
And we can see that through numerous uh, treaties. We can see that through numerous wars. We can see that through uh, numerous events that have happened, like the um, uh, failed assassination attempts to the Prophet Isatsam's survival over the course of 23 years in harsh conditions, all that stuff. Or do they have a God other than Allah? That is, do they have a God that they call upon and hope will benefit them and fear his harm other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Glory be to Allah, for exalted is he above having the partners they ascribe to him. For he has no partner in his dominion and no partner in his oneness or worship. That is the point of the previous verses, namely to highlight the falseness of worshiping anything other than Allah and to explain that doing so is false and wrong on the basis of definitive evidence. That what polytheists, uh, that what the polytheists follow is false and that the only one we should be worshiping, uh, excuse me, and that the only one should be worshiped, prayed to, prostrated to, and to whom the supplication of worship and the supplication of asking should be offered sincerely is Allah the only one who is deserving of devotion and worship, who is perfect in his names and attributes, who possesses many superlative, superlative attributes and beautiful deeds, the Lord of majesty and munificence, the almighty who cannot be undermined, the one, the unique, the eternal, the most great, the most praiseworthy, the most gracious. I mean, what a beautiful way um, to really address Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with respect uh, and to be in a state of humility when you're speaking about the Lord of the worlds, because no matter what we say, uh, apart from what he tells us about himself, could ever glorify him to the, to the magnitude that he deserves to be glorified, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, wonderful. So that brings us to um, verses uh, 46, uh, excuse me. So that concludes the, the um, uh, tefsid portion. We finished on verse 49. Coincidentally, that's also the end of that chapter. So we'll just jump right on in to the very next chapter. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is Surah An-Najm, uh, which is the star. By the star, when it descends, your companion, i.e. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, has not strayed, nor has he erred, nor does he speak from his own inclination. It is not but a revelation revealed, taught to him by one intense in strength i.e. Jibreel, Gabriel, one of soundness, and he rose to his true form while he was in the higher part of the horizon. Then he approached and descended and was at a distance of two bow lengths or nearer, and he revealed to his servant what he revealed, i.e. conveyed. The heart did not lie about what it saw. So will you dispute with him over what he saw? Now, uh, just a, a clear point of um, proof here, by the way. Uh, if anybody tells you that Islam is not objective, okay, meaning that the Prophet Islam had his own personal experience, okay, um, point number one, there was a messenger between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? So, uh, objectively speaking, the Prophet Islam received the message via an objective source, okay? And secondly, we can vet this objective source when Jibreel alayhi salam took human form. And thirdly, we can vet through evidences that people have seen when the Prophet alayhi would receive certain revelation, they would witness the things that were happening to him physically, and they would also be able to attest to the events that transpired as the Quran was being revealed, okay? And then fourthly, if you really wanted to get nuanced, the whole concept of the invention of language, which was a gift by the Almighty, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us um, uh, that he taught us language, he taught Adam the names of things, right? So he taught Adam meaning, he taught Adam uh, all languages, right? The very concept of language being taught to us brings us down to an objective standpoint. So depending on how, how nuanced somebody wants to get, but you know that's the difference between Islam and if somebody were to be saying, well, I just have this personal experience with God and I've got these visions and, and blah, 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 right? Okay, carrying on. Uh, so will you dispute with him over what he saw? Right? So there it is right there. 
the, the answer was given to you and now you have, will you dispute with him over what he saw? Meaning, oh yeah, his stuff was subject. No, it wasn't at all. Uh, and he certainly saw him in another descent at the low tree of the utmost boundary. And near it is the garden of refuge, i.e. paradise. When there covered the low tree, that which covered it. The sight of the Prophet ﷺ did not swerve, nor did it transgress its limit. He certainly saw of the greatest signs of his Lord. So have you considered Alat and Al-Uzza and Manat and the third, the other one? Is the male for you and for him the female? Uh, these, uh, Alat and Al-Uzza and stuff like that, these were all idols, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is having you reflect on that. Uh, and then is an unjust, uh, and that uh, that then is an unjust division. They are not but mere names. You have named them, you and your forefathers, for which Allah has sent down no authority. They follow not except assumptions, what their souls desire, and there has already come to them from their Lord guidance, meaning there were previous messengers, and these people refused the message. Or is there for a man whatever he wishes? Rather to Allah belongs the hereafter and the first life. And how many angels uh, there are in the heavens whose intercession will not avail at all except only after Allah has permitted it and whom he wills and approves. Meaning even though that these angels are making uh, prostration, they're, they're uh, making sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they're asking for human beings to be um, forgiven, the permission is still granted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that to take place. Indeed, those who do not believe in the hereafter uh, name the angels female names, and they have thereof no knowledge. They follow not except assumption, and indeed assumption avails not against the truth at all. So turn away from whoever turns his back on our message and desires not except the worldly life. That is their sum of knowledge. Indeed, your Lord is most knowing of who strays from his way, and he is most knowing of whom is guided. And to Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth, that he may recompense those who do evil with the penalty of what they have done, and recompense those who do good with the best reward. Those who avoid the major sins and immoralities, only committing slight ones, indeed your Lord is vast in forgiveness. He was most knowing of you when he produced you from the earth and when you were fetuses in the wombs of your mothers. So do not claim yourselves to be pure. He is most knowing of who fears him. Have you seen the one who turned away and gave little and then refrained? Does he have knowledge of the unseen so he sees? Or has he not been informed of what was in the scripture of Moses and of Abraham, who fulfilled his obligations, that no bearer of burdens will bear the burdens of another, and that there is not for man except that good for which he strives, and that his effort is going to be seen? Then he will be recompensed for it with the fullest recompense, and that to your Lord is the finality." and that it is he who makes one laugh and weep, and that it is he who causes death and gives life. Carrying on. And that he creates the two mates, the male and the female, from a sperm drop when it is emitted, and that incumbent upon him is the other, i.e. next creation, and that it is he who enriches and suffices and that it is he who is the Lord of Sirius, and that he destroyed the first people of Ad and Thamud, and he did not spare them. And the people of Noah before, indeed, it was they who were even more unjust and oppressing. And the overturned towns he hurled down and covered them by that which he covered. Then which of the favors of your Lord do you doubt? This prophet is a warner from i.e. like the former warners. The approaching day has approached. Of it, from those besides Allah, there is no remover. Then at this statement, do you wonder and you laugh and do not weep while you are proudly sporting? So prostrate to Allah and worship him. 
Now, uh, definitely worth visiting the Tefsia here, especially in regards to the Lord of Sirius. So let me try to locate that really quickly for us. Um, so this is 53 verse 48, 49. We'll see which one of these are um, clustered together to see what uh, Asadi has to say about this. Okay. Let me take a look. There might be some some beneficial stuff uh, before that. There is a footnote here. So here it says, uh, footnote 52. Let me just briefly skim it real quickly. Okay. So 49 onwards. Here's what he says. Have you seen the reprehensible condition of the one who is commanded to worship his Lord and affirm his oneness, but he turns away from that? If he feels like giving a little charity, he will not persist in doing so. Rather, he will become stingy, stop giving, and withhold his charity. So a one, such a one is not charitable by nature. Rather, his nature is to turn away and be disobedient and not persist in doing charitable deeds. Yet, despite that, he praises himself and raises himself to a status over his true status before Allah. Does he have knowledge of the unseen such, such that he has insight into the unseen and speak of it? Or does he attribute falsely to Allah things that he never said, audacity, uh, audaciously combining bad deeds with self-praise, as in indeed the case, because he knows that he has no knowledge of the unseen, and that if he makes such a claim, the definitive information about the unseen that was brought by the infallible prophet is contrary to what he says, and that proves that what he says is false. Or has he, namely the one who makes his claim, not been informed of what is in the scriptures of Musa and of Ibrahim who have fulfilled his duty? Uh, that is, he did everything with which Allah tested him and that he commanded him to do of laws and fundamental and minor matters of religion. Those scriptures contain many rulings, among the most significant of which are those mentioned here, that no bearer of burdens can bear the burden of another. That man will have nothing but what he strives for. That is, each person who strives will have his own deeds, both good and bad, and no one will have a share of the deeds and efforts of any other person, nor will anyone carry another person's uh, burden of sin. That his deed will be examined in the hereafter, and his good deeds will be dis uh, distinguished from his bad deeds. Then he will be requited in full. That is, purely good deeds will be requited with uh, that which is the best, a.k.a. paradise, and purely bad deeds will be requited with that which is the worst, a.k.a. hellfire, and deeds that are mixed between will be requited accordingly. All of creation will acknowledge the justice and kindness of Allah and will praise Allah for that to the extent that even when the people of hell enter hell, their hearts will be filled with praise of their Lord and acknowledgement of his perfect wisdom and their own loathsomeness. They will acknowledge that it is they who brought it upon themselves and cause themselves to meet his ba uh, this bad fate. Now, that's pretty interesting because I never really thought about what the the people who enter hellfire would look at um, in regards to Allah. Like, what would be their personal reflection? And of course, I mean, what other choice do you have other than acknowledging that He was telling you the truth and that it's your own fault? But the fact that they themselves would acknowledge His perfect wisdom. And they would be filled with praise of their Lord is, is pretty cool. I never really thought about it from that angle, but it is the truth, right? And it's very sound reasoning to think that way. Perfect. Um, let's see if there is some other little golden nugget that I can skim really quickly. Uh, so here's in regards to that it, it is he who is the Lord of Sirius. Sirius is a star, also known as the dog star. Allah singles it out for mention, although he is the Lord of all things, because this star was worshipped during the Jahiliya period. Thus Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights the fact that the like of what the polytheist worship is controlled and created, so how can it be taken as a god alongside Allah? that he destroyed the ancient tribe of Ad. They were people of Hud who rejected Hud, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them with a furious wind. 
uh, and Thamud, who were the people of Saleh a.s. Allah sent him to Thamud, but they rejected him. Then Allah sent the she-camel to them as a sign, but they hamstrung her and rejected him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them, sparing none. Uh, very interesting that they used that um, form of worship in regards to Sirius, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, called them out on it, right? And <laughs> I don't know if this is just, again, this is just my own personal reflection, but the fact that it's known as a dog star, uh, dogs are servants, right? So I wonder if that is yet another thing to reinforce, like how stupid were you polytheists that you were serving something known as that, that is a servant to man, right? And um, interestingly enough, dogs are incredibly loyal, right? So, you know, uh, just to have this like false loyalty to this um, servant star, which is a creation is just, I don't know, again, own personal reflection, but I don't want to head too much down a rabbit hole on that one. Um, but yeah, subhanAllah. Okay, wonderful. So uh, that concludes Surah, uh, Surah Al-Najm, which is the star. Next up, we have uh, Surah Al-Qamar, which is the moon. So here we go. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The hour has come near and the moon has split in two. And if they see a sign, i.e. a miracle, they turn away and say, passing magic. And they denied and followed their inclinations. But for every matter is a time of settlement. And there has already come to them of information that wherein is deterrence, extensive wisdom. But warning does not avail them. So leave them, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the day the caller calls to something forbidding, Yeah, forbidding. Uh, their eyes humbled. Their eyes humbled. They will emerge from the graves as if they were locusts spreading. Racing ahead towards the caller, the disbelievers will say, this is a difficult day. The people of Noah denied before them, and they denied our servant and said, a madman, and he was repelled. So he invoked his Lord, and indeed I am overpowered, so help then we opened the gates of the heaven with rain pouring down and caused the earth to burst with springs and the water met for a matter already predestined. And we carried him on a construction of planks and nails, sailing under our observation as a reward for he who had been denied. And we left it as a sign, so is there any who will remember? And how severe my punishment and warning and we have certainly made the Qur'an easy for remembrance. So is there any who will remember? I had denied and how severe my punishment and warning. Indeed, we sent upon them a screaming wind on a day of continuous misfortune, extracting the people as if they were trunks of palm trees uprooted. And how severe were my punishment and warning. And we have certainly made the Qur'an easy for remembrance, so is there any who will remember? Thamud denied the warning and said, it is one human being among us that we should follow. Uh, and said, is it one human being among us that we should follow? Indeed, we would then be in error and madness. Has the message been sent down upon him from among us? Rather, he is an insolent liar. They will know tomorrow who is the insolent liar. Indeed, we are sending the she-camel as a trial for them. So watch them and be patient. And inform them that the water is shared between them each day of drink attended by turn. But they called their companion and he dared and hamstrung her. And how severe were my punishment and warning. Indeed, we sent upon them one shriek, i.e. a blast from the sky, and they became like the dry twig fragments of an animal pen. And we have certainly made the Qur'an easy for remembrance, so is there any who will remember? The people of Lot denied the warning. Indeed, we sent upon them a storm of stones, except the family of Lot, we saved them before dawn. As favor from us, thus do we reward he who is grateful. 
and he had already warned them of our assault, but they disputed the warning, and they had demanded from him his guests, but we obliterated their eyes, saying, Taste my punishment and warning. And there came upon them by morning an abiding punishment, so taste my punishment and warning. And we have certainly made the Qur'an easy for remembrance, so is there any who will remember? And there certainly came to the people of Pharaoh warning. They denied our signs, all of them. So we seized them with a seizure of one exalted in might and perfect in ability. Are your disbelievers better than those former ones? Or have you immunity in the scripture? Or do they say we are an assembly supporting each other? Their assembly will be defeated and they will turn their backs in retreat. But the hour is their appointment for due punishment, and the hour is more disastrous and more bitter. Indeed, the criminals are in error and madness. The day they are dragged into the fire on their faces, it will be said, taste the touch of Sakab. Indeed, all things we created with predestination. And our command is, not, is but one like a glance of the eye, and we have already destroyed your kinds. So is there any who will remember? And everything they did is in written record, and every small and great thing is inscribed. Indeed, the righteous will be among the gardens, uh, among gardens and rivers, in a seat of honor near a sovereign, perfect in ability. Now, subhanAllah, uh, <coughs> this is one of my favorite um, surahs of the Quran. And um, to me, it is one of the clearest, clearest forms of a reminder. Not only does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us uh, a step-by-step -step on what types of punishment were administered, but he gives you clean-cut um, clean uh, stories of what took place. And then he tells you, one was punished by water, one was punished by wind, one was punished by earth. Uh, one was punished by, you know, and meaning he has dominion and control over everything. And the the my the part that hits home for me is that he says we have made this Quran easy. So who and as a reminder, so won't anyone take heed? Meaning, like, what is wrong with you people? Like, wake up. Will anyone just could you just take a moment and reflect for just a minute? So let's see what the tafsir says uh, in regards to uh, this surah. And uh, subhanAllah, if you get a chance, please listen to it in Arabic because um, it is, uh, again, one of my favorite revelations. Okay, so here's uh, what Asadi has to say. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the hour which is the resurrection has drawn nigh and its time is at hand. Yet despite that these disbelievers still deny it and are making no preparations for its arrival, although Allah is showing them great signs of its approach. That should make people believe. One of the greatest signs of the truth of the message brought by Muhammad ibn Abdullah وسلم, is that when the disbelievers demanded that he show them miracles to prove the soundness and truthfulness of the message that he brought, he pointed to the moon, which by Allah's leave split in two one half over the mountains of Abu Qubais and the other over the mountains of uh, Huayqian. Uh, the polytheists and others saw this great sign, which occurred in the upper realm. There is no human, uh, where no human could create illusions by means of magic. They saw something the like of which they had never seen or even heard of happening to the previous messengers. They were shocked by it, but faith did not enter their hearts and Allah did not will good for them. So they resorted to their regular way of false accusations and transgression, saying, Muhammad has bewitched us. But the sign of that tr uh, having truly happened was to ask travelers who came to you. If he was able to bewitch you, he would not be able to bewitch those who were not present like you. So they asked every traveler who came to the city, and they told them that they had seen that. But they still said, incessant magic. That is, Muhammad وسلم, has bewitched us and he has bewitched others. These are accusations that nobody could be fooled by except the most foolish of people, the most misguided and the most lacking in reason. They did not only deny this sign, rather they denied every sign that came to them. 
for they were prepared to counter the signs with falsehood and reject them. Hence Allah says, but whenever they see a sign, they turn away. This does not refer only to the splitting of the moon. Rather, they reject every sign and have no intention of following truth and guidance. Their only aim is to follow their whims and desires. Hence Allah says, they deny the truth and follow their own whims and desires. This is like the verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, but if they do not respond to you, then know that they only follow their desires. And that's in Surah Al-Qasas, chapter 28, verse 50. If their aim was to follow their guidance, they would definitely have believed and followed Muhammad because Allah showed them at his hands clear signs, proof, and definitive evidence. But every matter will reach its inevitable conclusion. That is, until now, this matter has not, has not reached its conclusion, but it will do so. Then the believers will be enjoying the gardens of bliss and forgiveness and pleasure of Allah, whilst the disbelievers will be subjected to the wrath and punishment of Allah forever and ever. Um, let me see if I can uh, locate some additional detail and insights into uh, the events that transpired. So uh, sometimes he clusters them up pretty nicely. Let me see if... Um, if I can locate something. Okay, <clears throat> so he, I'm gonna try to chunk them up uh, segment by segment. So here he says, verily we have left it as a sign. Is there uh, then any who will pay heed? That is, we have left the story of Nuh with his people as a sign so that people may pay heed and realize that whoever disobeys the messenger and stubbornly rejects him, Allah will destroy them with widespread severe punishment or it may be that the pronoun it refers to the ark and ships in general, and that Allah has uh, taught his slave Nuh how to make them. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left that craft among the people as an indication and sign of his mercy and care for his creation and of his great might. Is there anyone who will pay heed? That is, is there any who will pay heed to the signs, pay attention and reflect upon them, for they are very clear and straightforward. Um, then how were my punishment and my warnings? Uh, then how were my punishment and my warnings? That is, how do you see the painful punishment of Allah and his warnings, which left no excuses for anyone? We have indeed made the Quran easy to understand and remember. Is there any who will pay heed? That is, we have made the words of this holy Quran easy to memorize and recite, and we have made its e meanings easy to understand and know because it is the best of speech in wording, the truest in meaning, and the clearest in interpretation. So for anyone who reads it with focus of mind, Allah makes it easy for him to attain what he seeks of knowledge, understanding and remembering, including everything that those who seek knowledge want to know of what is lawful and unlawful commands and prohibitions, rulings of requital, exhortation and stories from which to learn lessons, what one needs to know of true beliefs and true stories of the past and the future. Hence, knowledge of the Quran in terms of both memorizing and understanding is the easiest of knowledge and the noblest of all branches of knowledge. It is beneficial knowledge, which if a person seeks it, he will receive divine help to attain it. One of the early generations said concerning this verse, there is no seeker of knowledge, but he will be divinely helped to attain it. Therefore, Allah calls his slave to study the Quran and pay heed to its contents by saying, is there then anyone who will pay heed? Uh, and again, couldn't have put it better myself, right? Could not have put it better myself. Um, let's see if there's another segment because again, those... Um, sequentially kind of repeat and we'll see if there is a uh, a grand uh, takeaway from this surah so no it seems like um there is uh, uh just the the clustering of those segments so once again he's going to go into each and every uh story and then show um that uh paying heed and uh having that personal reflection uh, once again. So take the time to reflect on this. And again, I really, really encourage you to uh, hear it in Arabic. But let's continue our reading. So next up, we have uh, Surah uh, Ar-Rahman. And uh, this is the most merciful, right? 
So carrying on. <coughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, the Most Merciful taught the Quran, created man, and taught him eloquence. The sun and the move, uh, moon move by precise calculation, and the stars and the trees prostrate. Uh, and the heaven he raised and imposed the balance, that you not transgress within the balance, and established weight in justice and do not make deficient the balance. And the earth he laid out for the creatures. Therein is fruit and palm trees having sheaths of dates, and grain having husks and scented plants. So which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? He created man from clay like that of pottery, and he created jinn from a smokeless flame of fire. So which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? He is Lord of the two sunrises and Lord of the two sunsets, meaning east and west, north, south, right? Um, uh, so uh, understand that. It can also mean as well, too, if you're depending on which segment of the hemisphere, right, you have different times of sunrise and different times of sunset, okay? Uh, he is Lord uh, carrying on. So which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? He released the two seas meeting one another. Between them is a barrier, so neither of them transgress. And once again, this is another miraculous claim by the Quran, uh, meaning that you have one salty water, one sweet, and there's a barrier between them. They meet, but they do not touch, right? Uh, so which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? From both of them emerge pearls and coral, meaning there's treasures within the sea and treasures within the ocean. So which of your uh, Lord's favor excuse me, which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? And to him belong the ships with sails elevated in the sea like mountains. So which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? Everyone upon it, the earth will perish, and there will remain the face of your Lord, owner of majesty and honor. So which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? Whoever is within the heavens and earth, ask him every day he is in, i.e. bringing about a matter. So which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? We will attend to you, O prominent beings. So which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? O company of jinn and mankind, if you are able to pass beyond the regions of the heavens and the earth, then pass. You will not pass except by authority from Allah. So which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? There will be sent upon you a flame of fire and smoke, and you will not defend yourself. So which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? And when the heaven is split open and becomes rose colored like oil, so which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? Then on that day, none will be asked about his sin amongst men or jinn. Uh, so which of the, your favors of your Lord would you deny? The criminals will be known by their marks and they will be seized by the forelocks and feet. Now, interestingly enough, a couple things here. <laughs> In regards to piercing the um, regions of the heavens and that you need permission, right? Uh, in regards to um, the quest for uh, ec the exploration of space, there was a spacecraft uh, by the name of the Challenger that went up. And one of the um, things that an, a key engineer uh, said was uh, that uh, God himself is not going to be able to bring this down, right? And this uh, spacecraft blew up when it was challenging. So like, who, who were you challenging? Like, what a stupid thing to call it, you know, a challenger. Uh, and the gentleman who um, uh, basically invented uh, the combustible fuel, uh, I'm drawing a blank on his name, but he was an open devil worshiper. And he said that he had a dream on how to create this uh, jet fuel, like this particular type of fuel in order to pierce the heavens, right? Um, uh, totally drawing a blank on his name right now, but whatever, he's not important. Uh, rather, it was the fact that he was trying to challenge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, in regards to verse 41, uh, the criminals will be known by their marks and they will be seized by their forelocks, okay? The use of forelocks over here uh, is so significant because somebody who is a liar utilizes their prefrontal cortex to commit lies. And they've done um, scans on the brain 
when the person is lying, these points trigger that look like four locks, okay? Uh, and I encourage you to take a look at that. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying is they will be seized by their four locks, meaning the places that they used to lie from, the angels will seize them by that. So uh, in another uh, chapter, which will be coming to soon, he says they're lying sinful forelocks, right? Uh, and in regards to the feet, I can imagine that the reason why the feet are being seized is because um, you won't be able to run away from for one. But for two, uh, you use your feet to walk towards a path. And if your forelocks were lying, uh, then your feet were following that lie. So they were they were conducting the actions to um, make that lie come to fruition, right? Like your feet and your hands can join. So it's interesting how uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses your feet and your forelocks right there. Anyway, continuing on. So which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? This is hell, which the criminals deny. They will circulate between it and scalding water healed, uh, heated to the utmost degree. So which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? But for he who has uh, feared the position of his Lord are two gardens. So which of the favored of your Lord would you deny? Having spreading branches. So which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? In both of them are two springs flowing. So which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? In both of them are of every fruit two kinds. So which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? They are reclining on beds whose linings are of silk brocade and the fruit of the two gardens is hanging low. I mean, it doesn't take much effort to get them. So which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? In them are women limiting their glances untouched before them by man or jinn. So which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? As if they were rubies and coral. So which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? Is the reward for good anything but good? So which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? And below them, both in excellence, are two other gardens. So which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? dark green in color so which of the favors of your lord would you deny in both of them are two springs spouting so which of the favors of your lord would you deny in both of them are fruit and palm trees and pomegranates so which of the favors of your lord would you deny in them are good and beautiful women so which of the favors of your lord would you deny Fair ones reserved in pavilions, so which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? Untouched before them by man or jinn, so which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? Reclining on green cushions and beautiful fine carpets, so which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? Blessed is the name of your Lord, owner of majesty and honor. Now, notice the structure of this particular revelation, right? It's giving you and then making you reflect. It says, look at this, and look at this, and look at this, and look at this. So point being is take a look around you, your eyesight, your hearing, your lungs, your kidneys, your, the, the, you know, your mental capacity, your hair, your nails, your, all of these are favors. Every single one of these are favors. And which one are you going to deny? And then you've got other favors to come. And which one of those are you going to deny? Meaning you are choosing to deny it or you are choosing to accept it, right? Okay, carrying on. Uh, this is Surah Al-Waqiyah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, when the occurrence occurs, there is, at its occurrence, no denial. It will bring down some and raise up others when the earthquake is shaken with convulsion and the mountains are broken down crumbling and become dust dispersing and you become of three kinds. Then the companion of the right, what are the companions of the right and the companions of the left? What are the companions of the left? And the forerunners and uh, the forerunners, excuse me, and the forerunners, the forerunners. Those are the ones brought near to Allah, 
in the gardens of pleasure a large company of the former peoples and a few of the later peoples on thrones woven with ornament reclining on them facing each other there will circulate among them young boys made eternal with vessels pitchers and a cup of wine from a flowing spring no headache will they have therefrom nor will they be intoxicated so remember the wine of jenna is not like the wine of dunya uh, and fruit of what they select and the meat of fowl from whatever they desire meaning all sorts of meats from all sorts of uh creations and even anew right it's things that we've never been exposed to and for them are fair women with large beautiful eyes the likeness of pearls well protected as reward for what they used to do they will not hear therein ill speech or commission of sin only a saying of peace peace the companions of the right what are the companions of the right they will be among loat trees with thorns removed and bananas uh, and banana trees layered with fruit and shade extended and water poured out and fruit abundant and varied neither limited to season nor forbidden and upon beds raised high, indeed, we have produced them, i.e. the women of paradise in a new creation and made them virgins, devoted to their husbands and of equal age for the companions of the right who are a company of the former peoples and a, and a company of the later peoples and the companions of the left. What are the companions of the left? They will be in scorching fire and scalding water and a shade of black smoke neither cool nor beneficial indeed they were before that indulging in affluence and they used to persist in the great violation and they used to say when we die and become dust and bones are we indeed to be resurrected and our forefathers as well say o muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam indeed the former and the later peoples are to be gathered together for the appointment of a known day Then indeed you, O oh those astray who are deniers, will be eating from the tree of Zakum and filling with it your bellies and drinking on top of it from scalding water and will drink as the drinking of thirsty camels. Meaning you're gonna be so, so, so thirsty. And it, it, you're just, you're, the pain is gonna be severe, but you're so thirsty and you won't be able to stop. That is their accommodation on the day of recompense. We have created you, so why do you not believe? Have you seen that which you emit? It is you who creates it, or are is it you who creates it, or are we the creator? We have decreed death among you, and we are not to be outdone. In that, we will change your likeness and produce you in that form which you do not know. And you have already known the first creation, so will you not remember? And have you seen that seed which you sow? Is it you who makes it grow, or are we the grower? If we willed, we could make it dry debris, and you would remain in wonder, saying, Indeed, we are now in debt, rather we have been deprived. And have you seen the water that you drink? Is it you who brought it down from the clouds, or is it we who bring it down? If we willed, we could make it bitter, so why are you not grateful? And have you seen the fire that you ignite? Is it you who produce its tree? Or are we the producer? We have made it a reminder and provision for the travelers. So exalt the name of your Lord, the most great. Then I swear by the setting of the stars, and indeed it is an oath if you could know, most great. Indeed, it is a noble Qur'an in a register well protected. None touch it except the purified, i.e. the angels. It is a revelation from the Lord of the worlds. Then is it to this statement that you are indifferent? And make the thanks for your provision that you deny the provider? Then why, when it, i.e. the soul, at death reaches the throat, and you are at the time looking on and we i.e our angels are nearer 
to him than you, but you do not see. Then why do you not, if you are not to be recompensed, bring it back if you should be truthful, meaning you're seeing your soul leave your body. But if you think that you're in command, bring it back, see what's up, right? Uh, and if he, i.e. the deceased, was of those brought near to Allah, then for him is rest and bounty and a garden of pleasure. And if he was of the companion of the right, then the angels will say peace for you. You are from the companions of the right. But if he was of the deniers who were astray, then for him is accommodation of scalding water and burning in hellfire. Indeed, this is the true certainty. So exalt the name of your Lord, the most great. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all of the companions of the right uh, by his mercy and his blessed guidance. Ameen. Next up, we have Surah Al Hadid. Bismillah rahman rahim Whatever is in the heavens and the earth exalts Allah, and he is the exalted in might, the wise. His is the dominion of the heavens and earth. He gives life and causes death, and he is over all things competent. He is the first and the last, the ascendant and the intimate, and he is of all things knowing. It is he who created the heavens and the earth in six days and then established himself above the throne. He knows what penetrates into the earth and what emerges from it and what descends from the heavens and what ascends therein. And he is with you wherever you are, and a law of what you do is seen. His is the dominion of the heavens and the earth, and to Allah are all matters returned. Uh, and I'll reread that. And to Allah are returned all matters. He causes the night to enter the day, and he causes the day to enter the night, and he is knowing of, uh, of that within the breasts. Believe in Allah and his messenger and spend out of, what, out of that in which he has made you successive inheritors. For those who have believed among you and spent, there will be a great reward. And why do you not believe in Allah while the messenger invites you to believe in your Lord and he has taken your covenant, if you should truly be believers? It is he who sends down upon his servant Muhammad وسلم, verses of clear evidence that he may bring you out from darkness into the light. And indeed, Allah is to you kind and merciful. Remember, this form of guidance is a, an ultimate form of mercy as well, because without that guidance, we wouldn't know what to do. And why do you not spend in the cause of Allah while to Allah belongs the heritage of the heavens and the earth? Not equal among you are those who spend before the conquest of Mecca and fought and those who did so after it. Those are greater in degree than they who spend afterwards and fought. But to Allah has promised, uh, but to Allah has promised the best reward, and Allah of what you do is aware. Who is it that would loan Allah a goodly loan? So he will multiply it for him, and he will have a noble reward. On the day you see the believing men and believing women, their light proceeding before them, and on their right it will be said, Your good tidings today are of gardens beneath which rivers flow, wherein you will abide eternally. That is what is the great attainment. On the same day, the hypocrite men and hypocrite women will say to those who believed, Wait for us, that we may re acquire some of your light. It will be said, Go back. Go back behind you and seek light, and a wall will be placed between them with a door, its interior containing mercy, while on the outside of it is torment. Meaning the people that were able to proceed through, uh, they will have uh, uh, mercy, right? And on the outside, well, not so, not so much. They, i.e. the hypocrites, will call to them, i.e. the believers, were we not with you? They will say, yes, but you afflicted yourselves and awaited misfortune for us and doubted and wishful thinking deluded you until there came to the command of Allah. And the deceiver, i.e. Satan, deceives you concerning Allah. So today no ransom will be taken from you or from those who disbelieve. Your refuge is the fire. It is most worthy of you and wretched is the destination. 
Has the time not come for those who have believed that their hearts should welcome humbly, submissive at the remembrance of Allah and what has come down of the truth? And let them not be like those who were given the scripture before and a long period passed over them, so their hearts hardened and many of them are defiantly disobedient. Know that Allah gives life to the earth after its lifelessness, and he had made clear to you the signs perhaps you will understand. Indeed, the men who practice charity and the women who practice charity and they who have loaned Allah a goodly loan, it will be multiplied for them and they will have a noble reward. And those who have believed in Allah and his messenger, those are in the ranks of the supporters of truth and martyrs with their Lord. For them is their reward and their light. But those who have disbelieved and denied our verses, those are the companions of hellfire. Know that the life of this world is but amusement and diversion and adornment and boasting to one another and com competition in increase of wealth and children. Like the example of a rain whose resulting plant growth pleases the tillers, then it dries and you see it turn yellow, then it becomes scattered debris, and in the hereafter is severe punishment and forgiveness from Allah and approval. And what is the worldly life except the enjoyment of delusion? Meaning people are racing and competing for just silly things. It's all going to be ashes and dust. Race, i.e. compete towards forgiveness from your Lord and a garden whose width is like the width of the heavens and the earth, prepared for those who believe in Allah and his messengers. That is the bounty of Allah, which he gives to whom he wills, and Allah is the possessor of great bounty. Now notice, uh, although that he gives us the example of racing and competition for this world, this is people that strictly do it for this world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't prevent you from seeking bounties to the point where you're wealthy. Um, what he's preventing you is seeking bounties to the point where you're wealthy and then hoarding it. So you should give it back because he's the one that gave it to you. And interestingly enough, when I deal with people on a handshake, especially in business matters, and again, you guys can conduct your own business matters in the way that you see fit, but I tell them straight up, I'm a believing individual. This is not my money. This is God's money. Whatever price you give me, uh, we're going to have a, a good sound discussion about it and just know that this money is in circulation. So I want people to get their true value of what they're worth. But at the same time, don't try to rip me off because you're just basically ripping God off. Right. And we just keep the circle going. If I trust you and you trust me, we can come to a good agreement and we can have more business uh, propagated amongst each other for future endeavors as well, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to race and compete towards the hereafter. So that wealth that you're amassing, use it for charity. Use it to help orphans. Use it to help travelers. Use it to help single moms, single dads, you know? Uh, these are the things to compete with, right? And to compete for, right? And then also, if you're in competition, uh, be in competition with yourself to be more charitable next year, to be nicer next tomorrow, to be, um, you know, uh, easier and to be more forgiving and so on and so on and so on. And then once you're in competition with yourself, compete with like the Sahaba, compete with people that were close to the Prophet that set a very, very good example. Uh, these are the people that we should be in competition with. Okay. No disaster strikes upon the earth or amongst yourselves, except that it is in a register. Before we bring it into being, indeed, that for Allah is easy. Um, indeed, that for Allah is easy. In order that you not despair over what has eluded you and not exult in pride over what he has given you. And Allah does not like everyone self-deluded and boastful. Those who are stingy and enjoin upon people stinginess in whoever turns away, then indeed Allah is the free of need, the praiseworthy. We have already sent our messengers with clear evidence and sent down with them the scripture and the balance that the people may maintain their affairs in justice. And we sent down iron wherein is great military might and benefits for the people 
and so that Allah may make evident those who support him and his messengers unseen. Indeed, Allah is powerful and exalted in might. Now, interestingly enough, it says that we have sent down iron, right? So iron is not from the earth. It comes from stars. So it drops down, right, in the form of like pelting, like meteorites and so on. Uh, furthermore, as the earth was being constructed, it was hit by things, one of them being uh, iron. So uh, there is a great blessing in that iron. And notice how Allah subhanahu wa says, Allah is powerful and exalted in might, meaning you see the might of these big things in space and how we basically pelted the earth with it. Well, we're stronger than that, right? Uh, we being like the royal we, not like there's a plurality by any means. And he and we have already sent Noah and Abraham and placed in their descendants prophethood and scripture. And among them is he who is guided, but many of them are defiantly disobedient. And we sent following their footsteps, i.e. traditions, our messengers, and followed them with Jesus, the son of Mary, and gave him the gospel. This is the Injil. It's just translated gospel here. And we placed in the hearts of those who followed him compassion and mercy and monasticism, which they innovated. We did not prescribe it for them, except that they did so seeking the approval of Allah, but they did not observe it with the due observance. So we gave the ones who believed among them their reward, but many of them are defiantly disobedient. Uh, definitely worth checking out the tafsir here. So I'm going to try uh, to locate it very quickly because uh, this definitely caught my point of interest here. So let me get over to 57 verse 27. And uh, here we go. Okay. <clears throat> So, here is what it says. Okay. Let me just make sure that this is... Yes. Okay. Perfect. So, here we go. <clears throat> Have we mentioned the prophethood of the prophets in general? Allah now, uh, having mentioned the prophethoods of the prophets in general, Allah now mentions two of the elite prophets, namely the noble prophets Nuh and Ibrahim, amongst whose descendants Allah conferred prophethood and the scripture. Hence he says, we sent Nuh and Ibrahim and confirmed upon their descendants prophethood and the scriptures. That is, the earlier and the later prophets were all descendants of Nuh and Ibrahim, peace be upon them. Similarly, all of the scriptures were sent down to descendants of these two noble prophets. Some of them, that is, some of those to whom we sent the messengers, are rightly guided and followed their call, submitting to their command, and were rightly guided by them. But many of them are evildoers who failed to obey Allah and obey the messengers and prophets, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says elsewhere, but most of humankind will not believe, no matter how eagerly you desire it, and that's in Surah Yusuf, chapter 12, 103. Then after them, we followed them with another messenger, with other messengers of ours, and we sent after them Isa ibn Maryam, which is Jesus' son of Mary. Allah singles out Isa alayhi for mention because the context is speaking of the Christians who claim to be followers of Isa alayhi We gave him the gospel, which is one of the books of Allah, so it's the Injil, and instilled kindness and mercy in the hearts of those who followed him. This is like the verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you will surely find that the bitterest among people in enmity towards the believers are the Jews and those who ascribe partners to Allah. And they will surely find that the closest among them to the believers in affection are the ones who say, we are Christians. That is because among them are scholars and ascetics and they are not arrogant. That's in Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, verse 82. So we covered that earlier. Hence, the Christians are more gentle and soft-hearted than others because they follow the teachings of Isa al-Sana. As for monasticism, we did not prescribe it for them. They invented it. What is meant by monasticism is extra acts of devotion. They made it up themselves and imposed it as a duty upon themselves, committing themselves to things that Allah had not prescribed for them or imposed on them. Rather, they took it upon themselves on their own initiative, seeking thereby the pleasure of Allah. 
Yet despite that, they did not observe it faithfully. That is, they did not do it properly. Thus they fell short on two accounts. One, by inventing it, and by not adhere, and two, by not adhering to what they had imposed upon themselves. And this is usually the case with them. But among them were some who did adhere to the command of Allah. Hence he says, so we granted those among them who believed their reward. That is those who believed in Muhammad, والسلام, as well as believing in Isa. Allah gave to each of them according to his level of faith. But many of them are evildoers. This may be addressed to the people of the book who believed in Musa and Isa, peace be upon them, instructing them to act in accordance with their faith by fearing Allah, refraining from disobedience to him, and believing in his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For if, for if they do that, Allah will grant them a double share of his mercy, that is two shares of reward, one share for their belief in earlier prophets, and another share for their belief in Muhammad sallallahu or it may be that the command in general is general in meaning that is addressed to both the people of the book and others, which is what appears to be the case, and that Allah instructed them to believe and to fear him, which includes all issues of religion, both outward and inward, fundamental and minor issues. If they obey this important command, Allah will grant them a double share of his mercy, the description and the extent of which no one but Allah knows. It may be a reward for believing and a reward for fearing Allah or a reward for obeying the commands and a reward for heeding the prohibitions or it may be that referring to a double reward means that the reward will be given repeatedly time after time. Uh, give you light by which to walk. That is, he will give you knowledge, guidance and light by which to walk through the darkness of ignorance and he will forgive you your bad deeds. Okay, so um, wonderful. Uh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So uh, I will reread this portion just because that was a good chunk that was covered in tafsir. Uh, then we sent following their footsteps, i.e. traditions, our messenger, and followed them with Jesus, the son of Mary, and gave him the gospel. And we placed in the hearts of those who followed him compassion and mercy and monasticism, which they in innovated. We did not prescribe it for them, except they did so seeking the approval of Allah but they did not observe it with due observance. So we gave the ones who believed among them their reward, but many of them are defiantly disobedient. So now that we've covered that in the tafsir, we have a comprehensive knowledge on that. O oh, you who have believed, fear Allah and believe in his messenger. He will then give you a double portion of his mercy and make for you a light by which you will walk and forgive you. And Allah is forgiving and merciful. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those that receive that light. This is so that people of the scripture may know that they are not able to obtain anything from the bounty of Allah and that all bounty is in the hand of Allah. He gives it to whom he wills and Allah is the possessor of great bounty. Uh, wonderful. Let me see if there's just, um, there's just a small note here. That is the people of the book may know that they may have no power over anything of Allah's grace. That is, we explain to you our grace and generosity towards those who believe in general terms and fear Allah and believe in his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So as to let the people of the book know that they have no power over anything of Allah's grace, in other words, they cannot restrict the grace and bounty of Allah in accordance with their whims and desires and corrupt thinking and say that uh, no one will enter paradise unless he is a Jew or a Christian. And that's a reference in Surah Baqarah 2, 111. This is wishful thinking about Allah on their part. Allah tells us that those who believe in the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and fear Allah will have a double share of his mercy, light, and forgiveness despite the people of the book. And so that they may know that grace is in, in the hands of Allah alone. He bestows it upon whomever he wills, giving it to those whom his wisdom dictates should be recipients of his grace. For Allah is possessor of abundant grace and no one could estimate the extent of his grace at all. Beautiful. Uh, alhamdulillah, that concludes the 27th juz. So I do want to conclude the reading with Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah. Allahumma salli ala sayyidina wa habibina Muhammad wa ala ali wa ashabi ala Muhammad kama sallaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali wa ashabi Ibrahim fil alamin innaka hamidun majid. Allahumma barik ala sayyidina wa habibina Muhammad wa ala ali wa ashabi ala Muhammad 
كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال واصحاب ابراهيم في العالمين انك حميد مجيد